Um, yeah, no, I think the like, people have really started to realize that, um, you know, you can take all of the, the plant matter in the world, you can take the whole atmosphere and it still doesn't add up to the same scale of, of a sink that the soil is. So take a sip and breathe. Cheers. And Cheers. <laughs> hmm. I got some great pictures at your winery on Saturday, just the, the, the glasses on the trays. The, I bought my husband a present in your gift shop. Someone was there in a Tesla Model Y I hadn't seen yet. I went over and <laughs> I went over and asked, I said, you know, I'm covered in dirt and everything. And I said, do you mind if I ask? And he came specifically because he knew we had chargers. So I was like, yes. Oh, cool. Super cool. Number one, charge stations cool. are a temptation. And he said, I think this is going to be the number one best-selling car next year. That's cool. But that's cool. There's some guy. I like awesome. that. I never did make introductions. This is Lauren and this is Suzanne. Nice to meet you. <laughs> you I, I might be taking a trip on Saturday myself. Um, now that, I, you know, now that we're meeting and Jody said that it's exceptional and I'm an interior designer and I feel like I would just probably like the, the, the place in general. So <laughs> you can give us advice actually. Oh, good. It's good timing. We're, we're, we've just done a bunch of upgrades. Um, so but you can give us advice on any additional changes. It's um, with the pandemic, we had to kind of reorient everything from like a stand up. Everyone crowded the bar to everyone yeah. spread out and sit. And um, uh, just, but but being closed for three months gave us a chance to put new flooring down. So I got to work with one of my favorite companies called Interface. Have you ever used any of their? Of course, yeah. Amazing, love them, amazing. Yeah. Um, and and anyway. I would just yabber on with you guys like socially, but we can do that. If you're coming Saturday, we can chat. Um, but I guess you probably want to do interviews. Otherwise I would just like yabber on about it and get your ideas. And No, this is pretty much yabbering on. <laughs> yeah. We just, we just kind of go where the conversation goes. We've oh. stopped even doing really introductions at this point because we feel like it just makes it too formal and disrupts the flow. So we just, well, and how did you guys team up? So we met um, through a U.S. Green Building Council, the New York Upstate chapter is what it was called. Um, Jody is a past chair. Um, you might have just been stepping out of chair when I joined. I don't remember. I think so. Yeah. So you, of course, know Interface then. Yeah. 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 And actually, I did a, I developed a training program with them for New York State staff, and we trained about 140 staff. But I worked with Interface Rays um, for, God, 10 months and a local film company called Magic Wig out of Schenectady. Hmm. And that was really fun, too. So One of my best friends in D.C. for many years is a, a brilliant guy named Bill Browning. Oh, I who, know Bill. Yeah, yeah, he's really involved in it with Rick Fedrizzi in, in the early days of setting up the USGBC. You, you seem to have, so obviously the winery in and of itself, well, I'm just like trying to put the dots together at this point, going in the other direction. So they, they don't connect the dots. You are have, just <laughs> but you, you have all of these different facets and like exciting kind of components associated with sustainability. And then you have your winery. So like, did you have a, a life before the, the winery that led you into sustainability? How did you get here? <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> um, that's funny. So yes and no, actually. Um, the winery was born about the time I was born. My um, my parents started the winery. Gosh, do I want to say my name on a, my, my age on a podcast? Anyway, the, the winery and I started about the same time. So my, my family's been farming this land for seven generations, but my parents started the winery about 40 years ago. Okay. Um, and uh, I have been working on it ever since. So I grew up with the winery um, on the farm and then um, you know studied environmental science studied you know international relations and natural resource management overseas and, and in DC and um, ended up working in DC for 12 years um, environmental defense fund for world watch and then I've been freelance consulting since 2007 um, I went out on my own and got so used to having the freedom to just be my own boss and and it allowed me the flexibility to come home for you know a month during the summer or to help for a week during harvest um and then um be able to kind of pick and choose and combine interesting problems that I wanted to work on so really had wanted to focus on sustainable agriculture and agriculture is a is a solution to climate 
but always kept getting pulled into energy. And it's just, you know, in the past few years that I feel like the climate community has woken up to the fact that agriculture and food and land is, yeah. is, is a, you know, a huge critical part of all of it and probably a third of the climate problem to begin with and, and thus a third of the climate solution. Um, never treated soil as a resource. We've gotten really good at understanding energy as a resource, then understanding water as a resource. Mm -hmm. Now I think we're finally starting to understand soil as a resource, and especially in the biogenic carbon realm for buildings. And that, you know, that's where you can sequester carbon in natural materials in buildings. Um, in that regard, it's not just the materials you use in the building, but how you farm them or how you raise them and keeping that carbon in the soil. Um, yeah, no, I think the people have really started to realize that, um, you know, you can take all of the, the plant matter in the world, you can take the whole atmosphere, and it still doesn't add up to the same scale of, of a sink that the soil is. Yeah. Um, and the fact that we've severely degraded, you know, something like 60% of our agricultural soils around the world. It's just this huge opportunity to put all that carbon back and, um, and solve a bunch of other problems at the same time, you know, flood resilience, drought resilience, you know, safety, you know, all of a sudden our, you know, our farm has become a sponge. So when we get these crazy microbursts and things, you know, we don't contribute to flooding that, you know, damages property and endangers life. So yeah, there's just wow. so, so many, so many interesting things to do in agriculture and it's, um, there's so much, I think people are starting, especially with, you know, one of the only like silver landings of the pandemic is people started to realize, wow, the people that grow my food and prepare my food and deliver my food are actually providing this vital service that <laughs> I really appreciate now. Um, yeah, so I've been freelance forever. And so I still have a more than full consulting plate um, and then help run the farm and the winery. What's your specialization in consulting? Like, <laughs> realm, do you have one? And what realm do you enjoy most? Let's put it that way. Specialization would make things easier, but um, <laughs> as soon as I think I know a lot about something, I, I jump to something else. Um, I, uh, I was very deeply expert in, in biofuels. Um, sadly, I'm using my book to hold up the, the, the device that we're recording <laughs> on. I would show you my book. Um, What's one thing about biofuels that that surprised you or that we don't know that we should know? Hmm. Oh, gosh. Um, so I sort of got into the biofuels mess because, well, so biofuels are just really complicated. Yeah. They, you know, they can be absolutely phenomenal for the world or absolutely destructive. And it all depends on what you use how it's produced, how you, and then and how it's used and what it's displacing. We have so much organic waste, um, and much of it breaks down into methane and leaks out of landfills or comes from our, our wastewater. And so, one of the obvious climate solutions is to capture that methane and destroy it. And um, yet, because biofuels have, um, you know, they elicit a real emotional negative reaction from a lot of people kind of the good and the bad and the ugly all get mooshed together and biofuels is sort of taken off the table is, is, is a tool in our toolkit. And, um, you know, hand, like destroying our methane and using it to displace fossil gas or foss, uh, other fossil fuels is, is something we need to be doing. It's, you know, if we're gonna actually reduce our climate impact. I've been surprised that, that renewable natural gas has been glommed in with fracked gas and with, with fossil gas. For some reason, fracked gas and, and other mined gas that's um, fossil fuel based gas has become natural. And then when you say uh, methane, there's an instant response that somehow it's not as good as natural gas when it's really, really not the case. Yeah, you could use it for, for a number of things. I mean, they do, we do have some, um, some uh, landfill gas capture and use in New York, but yeah, it could be so much more. And that's why I think, you know, policies that actually acknowledge that, can I swear on this? Can I swear? <laughs> shit happens, <laughs> you know, shit, ha you know, and there's just a lot of waste and we have to deal with it and just pretending that it's not there because it doesn't fit our like yeah. purist, you know, like it, it's a messy world and we've got a lot of, a lot of, um, we have to have a really diverse set of solutions and, you know, actually utilizing all the methane that's coming out of landfills is one of them.
for the waste sector produces such it's something like 10 it's about 10 percent of our climate impact in new york that we really have to address tapping into the methane emissions which are already there which need yeah. to be tapped into yeah yeah so yeah animals. total totally different thing totally yeah exactly oh good oh good yeah no it's, it's like this is exactly the conversations we need to be having like yeah. you know right. what are things that we want to you know legislate you know off the table and what are the things that we are there and we have to deal with them and yeah um, well, the climate law, what do you think is, I mean, I've been involved with some of the implementation work for energy efficiency and housing. The, the drum that I've been beating is embodied carbon because nobody was talking about embodied carbon. They were dismissing it as, uh, as, as unimportant. I think the other thing that they, I'm not in the energy team, but I'm wondering if you've heard anything about about how they're dealing with uh, bi with um, biofuels or bio approaches. Um, well, so I I actually um, I'm doing a lot of my consulting work right now for um, so the quick answer is yes, um, and I'm I I um, and in a bunch of different ways with different hats on. So I I do a lot of my consulting for a, a company called Generate Capital. Hmm. It was founded about seven years ago specifically to build, own, operate, and provide finance for green infrastructure. And so currently they're focused on transportation, energy, and then waste and wastewater is there. That's why I'm like, my brain is so much in, in, in waste as well as ag and energy. Um, and so, you know, they uh, build, own, operate food waste digesters. You know, so taking this massive, so, so trying to take the waste that would go to a landfill and create this, you know, awful landfill gas. Yeah. Um, and actually put it into a purpose-built digester, you know, with super, you know, super high-tech sensors, you know, very you know, well-run digesters to trap the methane and use it to displace, boss, you know, fossil-generated right. power and heat and power. One of the most interesting areas of consensus that was sort of hard, you know, took lots of conversations and wh where we ended was um, we need... Um, outcomes-based, like performance-based regulations. So rather than be pres prescriptive in our policymaking, where, because the technology and innovation is always way faster than you can legislate and, and, and regulate. Um, so, you know, we don't need to mandate, for example, that every dairy put a plastic cover in a flare system, which is what, you know, there were stakeholders pushing for that. But rather what we need to say is like, we want you to reduce your methane production. And then you guys you figure it. out the most cost-effective, most innovative yeah. way, the healthiest way for your animals, for your people. And then um, we're gonna just monitor it. So then the scientists love it because they actually have some visibility and some data to work with and actually understand what's really happening. Mm -hmm. So basically performance-based regulations where we say, this is the outcome we want for, in terms of climate impact reduction. And then you guys innovate. And then ideally, you know, and so that, so that you then you get much bigger, in, like better innovations way cheaper um and the farmer doesn't feel like he's being beat up you know by being told what to do and he's like actually respected as he or she's respected as an innovator it's 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 tough because especially the regulation side has been prescriptive today i mean energy codes have been prescriptive everything has been even the lead rating system started as a prescriptive method yeah and getting to that performance side you used the word messy earlier it is messier but it is mm -hmm. supportive of innovation. It's supportive of iterative learning. It yeah. really puts, yeah. puts the onus on the essence, the essential aspects of the project at hand and what works best for that project. So it's brilliant in so many more ways than, than a prescriptive approach. But it sounds like, especially as these innovations start to kind of come online, people can start to apply them to different types of industries. So for example, like I know that Saranac FX Brewery has a digester as well for a lot of their waste and their brewing processes and they love it. I think it's been installed for a couple years maybe at this point and they've seen um they just they couldn't they couldn't talk about it enough and I mean just talking about all of the environmental benefit to having that as part of their kind of literal post production of mm -hmm. the waste that they were generating. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in a lot of the, and it often makes sense, you know, another thing about this performance-based approach is you could just say dairy farm, you have to reduce your emissions. 
and you don't necessarily have to pay for it. You could work with a third party that's going to do what they do in a lot of parts of Europe where you have a professional digester operator that operates a whole bunch of them. So you have one engineer that services, you know, a fleet of them. And so your costs go down and then the dairy farmer can just focus on being a good farmer and he doesn't have to become an expert in digesters or the, the farmer could figure out a way where you don't end up with slurry maybe at all. Maybe they go back to more of a pasture basis. So maybe they go, you know, they, 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 they become a more high end, smaller operation. Um, that the, the scale is actually something that we actually made a lot of good progress on. You know, if you're a 5,000 head dairy, you should not be treated the same as someone that has 20 cows. And most farmers at some point have done a nutrient management plan or some type of farm plan. Right. And so then just layering on the carbon aspect, um, layering on maybe an energy efficiency audit, and then maybe even, um, you know, working to um, figure out where it might make sense to put solar on the farm, where it might not make sense. I mean, just to get back to the, the farm, is it is it a farm and winery? Is it a winery solely? What is the, what is the makeup? Yes. So it's a farm and a winery. Yeah. So we have uh, the farm where we grow, you know, something like 45, 50 acres of grapes. And then um, I don't even know how much hay we have now. There's something like 60 acres of hay. And then my brother um, has the, uh, the south end of the farm and um, he has a, he actually has a composting business. business. Nice. Um, and then we have a section, I don't know, section of woods. Um, I don't know, maybe you went for a walk out there. All of your siblings, you are all in some way still involved with like either at the family business or an offshoot of the family business, like something that my brother and his wife are, my sister is uh, an unemployment uh, lawyer for the government of Massachusetts. So oh, okay. she, yeah, she, so her job when we were kids, her job was to save the people. My brother's, or my job was to save the planet and my brother's job was to save the farm. And then as we got older, they got smooshed. They all got mixed and mixed around. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out it's all connected. <laughs> it is. Ding. Yeah, and basically we're done. You just said it all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so back to the winery. Yeah, it was such a great thing to visit on Saturday, and I and I know that Lauren will visit there, and mm -hmm. maybe she and I together will visit at some point. You had told me a few of the things. Actually, I learned about a few of the things through the Sustainable Futures Conference. So, solar panels, charging stations, resilient floor. Tell us a little about those and the other parts and pieces that we should be aware of regarding sustainability at your uh, vineyard and farm. Um, I mean, on the energy side, the, the energy side is like the flashiest stuff, you know, like, so you've got the 350 solar panels, you know, on all the roofs of the buildings, um, the, the five electric car chargers in the parking lot. Yeah, we, get, <laughs> we have people stop and we have people come in a Chevy Bolts that we're doing a cross country trip and they drank and ate all afternoon while it charged, you know, it's like, I take it, hydrate, hydrate. Um, uh, we, we get all kinds, you know, we have the, the there's a, an electric automotive association of New York and they come and have get togethers here. And there's a Tesla club of New York and they come and do events here. And it's really oh. fun. You know, you just get all these cool people coming and, and gathering. Like that's one of my favorite things about this is the becoming a gathering space for all these important conversations and gatherings. Um, but um, in terms of the, the physical infrastructure, the, the geothermal heating and cooling system is another big one. Um, my dad spearheaded that project almost a decade ago. Um, so now our heat pumps look like dinosaurs compared to the, their more modern versions. But, um, but yeah, it's a, a single you know, continuous closed ground loop that has eight, eight boreholes that go down almost 400 feet. Um, it's about 6,000 feet of, of piping. And um, each building has its own pair of heat pumps and that one um, ground loop, the capacity of the ground loop um, serves the four different buildings. Um, so that's, that's been really nice. And, um, you know, it's just amazing. You know, we save something like, you know, 10 to 12, $15,000 in heating, heating oil costs every year. And you spend a little bit extra in electricity, but now we've got the solar. So once that's paid off, um, our heating, cooling, and power will be essentially free, except for maintenance costs. I had formed a wine business coalition. They got together with other uh, winery owners, and they formed this coalition to try and, and fight off an oil and gas uh, infrastructure project under Seneca Lake. They were going to store oh. propane and um, other combustible, highly, you know, highly explodable combustible gases in, a, in salt caverns under Seneca Lake. 
I don't know if you heard, there are a lot of activists that were very involved in fighting that for years and years. Why was that a thing? Why was that even an idea? Um, so I think I think that they I'm not deeply expert in, in this, but apparently they tend to do this usually out in remote areas where you're not sitting underneath a town in the water source for 100,000 people. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, but it was a terrible idea. And so, you know, there's a whole huge grassroots effort to fight it. And then the wine industry got together and they were fighting it. And, and I said, you know, if I was Cuomo and I had all these people saying, no, 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 don't put it here. You know, my major point of pushback is you all use this stuff. It's got to go somewhere. So we got together and decided to go all a whole bunch of wineries go solar together. And the idea was that, you know, we're not being NIMBY. We're putting collectively millions of dollars towards the solutions. Um, but it was it was an epic amount of work because the local I had thought, oh, you know, we'll get we'll do it all as a group and we'll get the components costs down and the financing costs down because, you know, we'll have scale and um, but every single winery has a, a very long standing, strong relationship with their bank. And that bank is stuck with them through thick and thin. And there's a lot of thick and thin in an agricultural business. So um, so each winery ended up, you know, getting doing their own financing for their own solar project with their own bank. And then but then come to find out the local banks had never financed large commercial solar systems before. So so then <laughs> I was talking with a green bank that had just formed and um, they, the president, the newly hired president and um, some of the bankers were doing an upstate tour. So they agreed to spend the afternoon with some of my, some of our bankers and some of the winery owners. And I wish I had thought to record it because it was, it was literally, you know, just a couple hours of bankers asking their banker questions to other bankers. And, you know, how do you think about, um, you know, the warranties and how do you think about setting your interest rates and, and risks and, you know, all these bank, you know, they're speaking bankies to each other. And, it, you know, two hours later, our banks were off and running. And, you know, a year later, our bank had a, you know, multi-million dollar solar portfolio. And then they started innovating and offering innovative financing for your home geothermal systems if you wow. move to their bank. And, you know, and so I've been, that's one of the things that I, I wish I could get going. And I, I think we might, we're in the, a friend of mine is in the, the final round of maybe getting a grant at NREL to do nationwide, look at how we train all of the local banks. Because you could try and get you know, 300 and some odd million Americans to want to do this, or you could just train a few thousands of banks to offer it to their customers. Be like these super smart local bankers just needed to understand like how do we think about the degradation of the panels over time how do we price this how do we price you know and it was just literally like they just needed some a couple hours worth of training you know right. for solar right you know so there's lots of other you know mature technologies that they want you want them to be comfortable with too but it it didn't take much at all and they were off and running and you just think about that uh, multiplied across you know a rural state it's not that many banks and the other piece of it is, is DEC, Department of Environmental Conservation, has recommended that for all planning purposes, we use $125 a ton as the cost of carbon. So- Is that the value of it in my soil? Because that would be nice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's actually, you know, it, and, and, and so, so that should be a consideration in the planning. And we need to start to build that um, that knowledge base about how to do the carbon accounting, so that you can understand that in relationship to to risk mitigation. My 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 big mantra when I worked on climate action planning 14, 13 or fourteen years ago, we were very quick to figure out how much it would cost to make the changes we needed to make, but we didn't spend any time figuring out what it would cost to us if we didn't change. Right. And that's, yeah. that's a heavier, more onerous cost. It, and we haven't faced it. We haven't faced it at all. I mean, Microsoft has yeah. an internal cost of carbon they use in all of their accounting. Right. And I mean, it's really becoming a necessity for the big corporates just to maintain their social license to operate. Um, I mean, I was on a call this morning with, you, you're going <laughs> to, you're not going to believe this. But I mean, I was on a call this morning with one of the biggest agri-tech companies in the world. And we were talking about how we shift policy so that we actually can reduce the cost of crop insurance to farmers who reduce the risk by switching to regenerative farming practices. Awesome. You know, I mean, yeah. it, it, it's really, it's really, um, you know, 
bless all of the, the, the students and the young people that finally gave us, got us to a tipping point. You know, I've been slogging for decades. <laughs> And, and it's really been these new, these young, like youth driven movements that I, it, it feels like to me, I'd be curious, Jody, like how it feels for you. But I feel like that, that youthful, I don't know, like somehow we, we, it feels like we hit a tipping point. Well, I, what I thought you were going to say is that, you know, one of the, one of the kind of strategies that's been successful for, for the uh, status quo interests is to make us all feel like, you know, it's up to us to fix this this massive systemic problem. Like we just need to each recycle and bike yeah. to work and, and that's gonna fix it. And like in here, you know, these are epic systemic problems. I mean, the pandemic shut down the world and emissions, you know, dropped a little. Individual actions, while important and vital, are not gonna solve it. We have to have systemic changes, policy changes, cultural changes. Yeah. And we need everyone of every, every age group and especially our elders who tend to have more resources, more power, um, especially we need those, the, you know, those age groups to be kicking in all of that ex experience and expertise and resource. And I'm in for the long haul. And it sounds like you're in for the long haul. And I know Lauren's in for the long haul. Um, I think yeah, and we, and we need all the artists and the creatives. I think that was another thing. We, you know, I think it was, everyone kind of said, oh, the engineers will figure it out. The politicians will figure it out, you know, the technologists. And meanwhile, like, it, you know, so, so much of the, the culture change, it, you know, it's, it's often driven by, you know, artists, musicians, women, young people, you know, it's, it's literally whatever your personal passion and your, your, what your superpower is, it's needed. <laughs> I think you should wake up in the morning and reaffirm your superpower. <laughs> be a different one every day quite frankly but oh gosh but i wish i had a different one every day a couple of core superpowers that they know they can employ right i like the every day different one jeez that's a fun one that's cool i i i I, I, that one. I sense that you're an eclectic soul and you can see different layers of the system so a different one every day might work for you <laughs> terroir as an opportunity and I'm loving this wine that I'm drinking, which I'm gonna do the ad. This is an advertisement. This is uncharted, chartered terroir. So my parents founded the winery. They're still very active. We, this place wouldn't run without my dad. Um, my mom is currently injured. So that's the reason I, I say like she's, we're trying to keep it going well. She's a little bit laid up. Um, but um, my husband and I launched the Uncharted Chartered Terroir uh, brand last year it, it, to, to kick off like conversations among wine lovers about the impact of climate change on wines and terroir. And um, terroir is, it's, it's actually, a, it's a French kind of word that derives from the word terror, land, you know, earth. Uh, it's actually a really beautiful concept. It's, it's the idea is that um, when you're making wine, you are capturing the unique essence of your land, your place, your, your microclimate, your, you know, water, the human dimension, all of it in, in the wine, which makes each wine totally unique. Um, and that is a perfect concept for talking about how climate, it cha it, a change in climate is changing wine and it's changing terroir. And so that's why, um, you know, my ancestors came into, you know, uncharted territory for winemaking and started planting grapes in the eight, early 1800s. And, um, you know, and now, so they were, we're going into uncharted territory in, in, in grape growing and winemaking again, because the climate's changing. Climate is integral to, to the terroir. You know, it's very well documented. You know, there, there are vineyards in, in parts of Europe that have been growing grapes for hundreds and hundreds of years in the same spot that have been taking meticulous notes. And they can tell you how the harvest states are changing, how acid levels, sugar levels are changing. Um, you know, England is now a Pinot Noir producer and a champagne producer. Like who would have ever imagined that 40 years ago, 30 years ago? Yeah, because champagne was just really relegated to one area of France, right? The Apernay area. I only know that because one of my host families was in Apernay when I was traveling with up with people and she bootlegged champagne in her basement, which I wasn't supposed to tell anybody, but I have. <laughs> And we would go to the basement with her and I was translating the French really horribly and we were turning all the bottles of champagne in her basement. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and you know, the, the um, ice wines are very unique to Germany. Uh, well, we make an ice wine as well. We actually make, my dad was the first, 
first person to make a commercial ice wine in the U.S. and has been doing it ever since, um, about 1987, I think. Um, and um, you know, but it originated in you know in Germany, the ice wines. And last year, one grower in the entire country got an ice wine because it just wasn't cold enough. So, regarding the Finger Lakes region, which is where you are, mm -hmm. is there a trend that that is actually that you've noted that you're you're building toward adjusting to that trend? So another part of the Uncharted Terroir brand is 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 um, so essentially what we're doing with that brand is we are experimenting with some of our really rugged, resilient hybrid grapes, um, grapes that have been high, uh, that are a cross of some North American um, uh, genetics and, and European genetics. Um, They've been bred for winemaking qualities, but also ruggedness, resilience to mildew, resilience to uh, cold temperatures, things like that. Um, and so we're experimenting with those more rugged climate resilient grapes um, to see how far we can push them into the realm of, of high-end fine wines. We need to make our wine industries, but also you know, agriculture more broadly, more resilient through diversity. Mm, yeah, you know, we shouldn't have a quarter of the entire like land base of you know vineyards of the world be one variety. You know, like that's crazy, and that's the current situation. So you know, we really need to embrace diversity and not have a wine list that only has you know six types of great you know grapes well, listed. I've seen an expansion in the the, the type of wines. I, I don't recognize half the names. I'm not. Oh, good, good. I, my palate is not developed. I I, I really enjoy wine there are some that i don't like but i haven't i haven't developed a, a really good taste palette. practice that's, yeah. that's what it is <laughs> but i have to tell you that this one the cayuga white i'm enjoying very much tonight and um and we did the tasting at at your winery on saturday and it was it was great i brought home i think i bought four or five bottles from your winery and i want to i'm gonna you know i gotta start taking notes so that i can learn I didn't realize that it, there was a monoculture approach to, to, to grapes. And it sounds like it's, you're breaking away from it, which is great. Is it wonderful? Well, I mean, so on, on the positive side, you know, so our, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite wines is our uh, Riesling. So the Finger Lakes is becoming really well known for Riesling. Not one of those. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful grape from, you know, coming from Germany, grows really well here. Um, but it is, but it is not nearly as rugged and resilient. So when the polar air came here during in 2014, and where the Tuca is the highest elevation of the of the the wine producing Finger Lakes, uh, it got down to 18 minus uh, minus 18 degrees Fahrenheit here, and we had you know major damage to all the 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 vinifera vines. You know so the Cayuca Lake K E U K A. Cuca, yep, yep, Cuca Lake, yep, as opposed to Cayuga. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the Finger Lakes of, of New York, for anyone watching this, are have wonderful names, but several of them are, are similar to each other, unless you see them spelled. And you need to check out the Finger Lakes because um, there's a lot going on as far as, uh, as wineries in the Finger Lakes. Yeah, oh my gosh, it's a, it's a renaissance. What do you drink normally, Lauren? You, you've got a, I, you said you have a, a French Bordeaux with you tonight. Yeah, I know. It's not the most sustainable, but, but I am drinking <laughs> a French Bordeaux. Um, I am normally like a really dry red person. Yeah. Now, the the caveat to all of this is that I'm actually allergic to wine, but I love it. <laughs> so I have learned I'm not allergic to drinking it, but I can't do adequate tastings because I can't smell it. If I smell it, my eyes puff up. I start sneezing immediately. Oh, so I had people tell me that, you know, they're allergic to wine, not allergic maybe, but, but that they get headaches or they can't, yeah, yeah. you know, fights or and hurt. yeah, something like that. But usually, um, more often than not, they're drinking mass produced wine and wine is the ingredients are not regulated. This is this dirty little secret. Ooh, so you could awesome be getting, wine. So if you're buying low cost wine at the grocery store, well, depending on what state you're in, at the store, um, it might have big coloring agents, fake tannins, you know, all kinds, it's like it, all kinds of crap thrown in. And that's probably what's making you feel not so good. Not that it, not the wine. 
So if you're buying from a local producer that's just making wine and isn't, you know, mixing in all this other stuff, uh, you might actually do better. Challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> this work is so hard and you can, it can just be so exhausting and, and emo you know, emotional, painful. It, it, it's just, you know, we're trying to do really difficult things. And so you, I just, you have to have kind of a support team where you're working, supporting each other and figuring out hard problems together and going through difficult experiences together and like going through big successes and celebrating them together. Um, so I have a whole bunch of colleagues that I, I, that if you want people nowadays, I mean, I, there's a whole bunch of heroes, I think from, that have fought battles and won in the past, you know, from our suffragettes that were, you know, just in, you know, over the hill in Seneca Falls to, you, know, you name it. I mean, I think there's, there's so many cool heroes um, to talk about, but in terms of nowadays, I mean, gosh, there's so many amazing people. Um, you know, the, uh, the founder of, of Generate Cat, one of the founders of Generate Capital, who pulled me in, is a guy named Jigger Shaw, who I highly recommend everyone follow because he just he's recently joined the Biden administration um, and is doing great work at DOE. And he um, he was the one of the co uh, um, hosts of the Energy Gang podcast for a long time. So the Energy oh, Gang cool. podcast is a good one to listen to. Um, and um, my friend Allison Archambault in, in, in DC runs a nonprofit called Earth Spark International. It's um, building solar microgrids in Haiti and doing amazing innovation in, in, in that space. And um, gosh, there's so many people. Um, our friend Scott Splar, who's a, a gray beard, I don't know if he's on Twitter, probably not. He's but a any, he's a literal and figurative gray beard of solar and renewables. He's been pushing it since forever and finally you know it took it took a long time before we got to the point I mean I still remember I'm much younger than him I still remember when we were just totally patted on the head and like you know whisk out of, you know pushed out of the room when we would try and talk about renewables because it was never going to be a serious source of energy ever Gosh, there's so many people uh Ken Westrick is an amazing guy he uh founded three tier that does solar wind resource mapping. Um, and then he helped, he helped start up a company called Resurity. And now he's working on a company called Climatics. Um, so Kenneth Westrick is an awesome, awesome person to, to keep tabs on. Um, he's one of my favorite. He's such a good sense of humor. Um, you got to have the sense of humor. <laughs> oh my gosh, there's just so many. I've mentioned Bill Browning. Um, up in Upstate, um, uh, there's a whole, we have a whole informal women's network that, that I'll um, have to add you guys to. I haven't had the bandwidth to really keep it going during the pandemic. It's been so crazy, but um, there's just a <laughs> whole cast of Wonder Women heroes. Um, Sarah Zamanik at Cornell is amazing. She um, got Cornell, I think they're now one of only six universities in the world that's platinum rated. Holmes Hummel is brilliant. Holmes um, is doing a lot with Pay As You Save where you get utilities to pay for efficiency upgrades for low, low income housing. And then the cost of the upgrades is attached to the utility bill, not attached to the person. Yeah, if you don't know Holmes already, she's definitely someone you should know. Yeah. Solomon Khan and Swell is uh, <laughs> another long time, brilliant, brilliant financial mind started a company. They're doing you know behind the meter batteries and uh, battery storage. What's the biggest thing, what's the biggest initiative that people should know about right now? I mean, at this point in time, I feel like the most important thing for people to do is engage um, in our messy democracy um, and be politically active. I mean, that's the kind of foundational and core. And, um, and I also think the other, you know, so that's just, you know, that is core. We, we, I think the risks to our, our democracy are bigger than, than we maybe want to acknowledge. Um, and the only way we address these, to, to, to come full circle back to where we started the conversation, the only way we address these huge systemic problems is with huge systemic solutions like policy shifts. But um, the other thing is just that I think we've all, we've sort of relatively recently become more and more conscious of um, social justice issues being foundational back to the saving the planet saving the people saving the farm everything being connected you know you can't you can't address these environmental issues without addressing the, like all of these human aspects as well and and i think um becoming just more educated and more thoughtful and more conscious of what what our friends go through who you know have different ethnic backgrounds is um 
super important for us to all work at, even if we think we, if, even if we think we are already pretty darn conscious. I mean, you, you think that talking to someone who, who is associated with a vineyard, it's going to be a very focused conversation. And yet sustainability has proven time and time again that we can, we, we can't have limited conversations because everything ties to everything else and i applaud the fact that you're working at so many different layers in the system that your knowledge base is broad and specific that's what we need and, and the fact that you took the time to share it with us is is exceptional thank you and to share thank your you. wine which i'm i'm enjoying much more i'm not a white wine drinker but boy this is going fast <laughs> Well, I'm glad you're enjoying it. We have to um, we have to take time for 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 some joy as well with all this hard work. So I like that. I'm really Any, glad. Anything you want to ask us before we wrap up? Before we close it up? I want to talk. I want to hear all about the design work and the food forests and stuff. But but we'll have to do that another day. This has been Subject to Change, a sustainability podcast. Awesome. All right. Awesome. All right. Yeah. Great. Have a great night. Thanks for spending some time with us. Yeah, Thank we'll you. see you. See you soon, Lauren. Bye. Bye. Bye.